Hi, I'm Howie Rose, and welcome to One on One. My guest today is simply one of the best pitchers that the New York Mets ever developed. His name, John Matlack. John, great to see you again. Good to see you, Howie. Well, when John Matlack joined the New York Mets, and he'd been in the organization since the late 1960s, but when he joined the Mets in Cincinnati, or made his first start in Cincinnati in 1971, at that time, the Mets pitching staff included names like Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, Nolan Ryan, Gary Gentry, Tug McGraw, and here's a 21-year-old kid from Westchester, Pennsylvania, trying to fit in with that group. Was that somewhat daunting or intimidating? Very intimidating, no question. How so? I just remember telling my dad after I signed in 67 and went to instructional league that there were 18 or 19 pitchers down there, and they all threw harder than I did. So Which I told him he might have to send me a bus ticket home. Which is really interesting because, you know, in the early days of the Mets, and Casey Stengel used to talk about this, he would call it rapid advancement, that the best way to get to the major leagues quickly was to sign with the Mets because they were an expansion team that was trying to build and find their way. But along the way, when you were having success in the minor leagues, were you still concerned that there was so deep at the major league level that you would have trouble breaking in? There was no real concern about that because I wasn't even thinking about that. I was concerned with job number one, which was do the best I could wherever I was and try and win a ball game there. And hopefully by doing that, better things would come down the road. I think two of uh, John's more memorable games took place at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, including the very first one. And John pitched really well. In fact, was the pitcher of record on the long side when some stiff came out of the bullpen, That's terrible. I couldn't, but in the eighth inning, I let the lead get away. You remember who that stiff was? No, uh, that stiff was none other than George Thomas Seaver. How about that? It was the last game before the All-Star break, and that's when Tom made one of his rare relief appearances. But other than that, you held the big red machine to a couple of runs and in seven innings in your first big league game. What are some of the enduring memories about that first one? The clubhouse guy wanted to charge me for the carpet I wore out while I was pacing during the first game because this was the second game of a doubleheader. Uh, I was quite nervous. was a fun ball game. Gave up a home run, opposite field home run that, that put us behind. As you said, I was pinch hit for. We went ahead via that pinch hit. Uh, I forget who got it, but put us into a 3-2 lead. And they bring Tom in to relief. And I'm in the shower thinking, I got Seaver for a caddy. My first win's <laughs> in the books. But that didn't happen. Well, it, it, it happened plenty for Tom as a starter. It happened plenty of times for John Matlack as a starter, too. But the other game I reference in Cincinnati was one of, and I'm telling you, if you want to, on one hand, measure the five best clutch pitching performances in Mets history, uh, you could certainly include game two of the 1973 National League Championship Series. The Mets had lost a tough game in game one, two to one. And then you face that big red machine and one guy, only one guy, and it wasn't Rose, Bench, Perez, Morgan, Griffey, any of them, got both hits off of you in a two-hit shutout. Do you cringe at the mention of the name Andy Cusco? Oh, it just makes me sick. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how or why it all happened. It just was the way it fell into place. He hit a couple of ground balls between short and third, and that was all they did that day. So it, it turned out very well for us. Well, it certainly did, because not only do you win that game, but then the next day at Shea Stadium, uh, that's, I guess, when the brawl took place in Game 3 with Pete Rose and Bud Harrelson. But, you know, you put the Mets on track. They won Game 3, lost Game 4, and came back to win the pennant in Game 5. But what is it like to be in the zone that you were in in that second game in 1973. You don't really realize it. It's like being in a rocking chair. It all sort of works real smooth, and anything you think about with the baseball, you can do pretty much. Uh, Grody called a heck of a ball game. I was able to execute the pitches. Defense was solid. We put enough runs on the board. It all worked well. Did you learn anything from watching the Reds against Seaver in game one that you could put to use in game two? Well, I charted the game as we did most times when you were going to pitch the next day. And I remember looking back at the chart thinking, how do you do better than this? This was, I don't know, 14 or 15 strikeout game. He made a couple of mistakes, solo home run to bench, solo home run to Rose, I believe it was, that cost us a game. And the only thing I could come up with is don't let anybody on base because if you do, you're in trouble. So it was a one pitch at a time, one out at a time, one inning at a time approach that really, probably the first time I ever used that, but I tried to stay with it the rest of my career because it was very successful. And you were, and remember, we're talking about Seaver, Kuzman, John Matlack. You pitched as well, if not better, than 
any of those other two down the stretch in 73 when the Mets came literally from last place at the end of August and, and wound up winning the pennant. How does a team that's considered out of it, as you guys were for so much of that summer, suddenly begin, and we're going to go to you got to believe in its <laughs> roots in a moment, but get to the point where you're an afterthought for five months and now, gee, we can win this thing. How does well, that happen? I guess nobody in the division really raced away with anything. So everybody was close, and we just put together our best effort when it counted right there at the end. How or why it happened, I don't know, but it was so fun to be a part of. All right, well, history says that a lot of it is rooted in a press, not a press conference, of course, but a meeting that the board chairman, M. Donald Grant, had with the club uh, in mid-summer of 73 where he said, we still believe in you, we still believe in you, and that's when Tug McGraw started with, yeah, he's right, you gotta believe, you gotta believe. Did you think that Tug had galvanized the team with those words that day? Not that day, but you sort of, you sort of looked back at it and thought that was certainly where it started. Um, but why he continued with it, I can't tell you, he just did, but it was a big part of what we did going forward and was always there in the clubhouse. He would be yelling it, banging his glove on his leg, you gotta believe, and it, Stuck. Was the story that simple? The Grant came in, gave you guys a pep talk, Tug said what he said, or were there some other as, as factors as, in how that came together? As far as I know or remember, when the meeting broke up and, and M. Donald Grant's leaving and the clubhouse is breaking up, he just started yelling it as things were dissipating, and uh, it continued from there. Tug was a little bit of a character, as we all know, and uh, he... Filled that role, for sure. Well, it certainly continued all the way to the World Series for the Mets, and you wound up pitching the seventh game after a great performance uh, in game one, but there was the error by Felix Mion, which is so unfortunate because he was a tremendous second baseman. And then you come back and pitch another solid game in, in game four, and, and now the Mets win game five behind Kuzman. And all these years later, people wonder, what should Yogi have done? Because he had a choice. <laughs> He could have come back with a, uh, a guy named George Stone, who had a great year in 73, year. could have used George Stone in game six, had a fully rested Tom Seaver on four days rest pitch game seven with you on three days rest backing him up, or he could have gone with Seaver in six, you in seven, both on short rest as he did. Do you remember anything about how that all came together and uh, whether anything was said to you or Tom or even George about how these decisions were made? I don't remember anything ever being said to anybody else. As far as I was concerned, I was never told anything until they came to me and said, you're going to be pitching the seventh When game. did they tell you that you were going to get uh, game seven? I would assume pretty much right after game four. I mean, I don't, I don't think there was any difference. You were scheduled to pitch game seven mm -hmm. if it goes that far and prepare for that. Well, 73 is, is looked at as one of those years where the Mets somewhat overachieved and took advantage of a, a weak division. I've always thought that's not entirely fair to that club because your rookie year, you win the rookie of the year in 1972. John Matlack has a strong rookie, uh, I'm sorry, John Milner had a strong rookie year as well. And I think you finished first and he finished third, I think, in the, in the rookie of the year balloting. But you had a lot of good young talent on that club, got off to a great start in 72. A lot of guys got hurt. A lot of guys got hurt in 73 as well. And when they got healthy is when you made your move. So do you think that think that that team has been shortchanged a little bit over the years in the credit that it received? I don't know. It would be hard to assess. I was a young kid, rookie, second year, just sort of feeling my way through, trying to keep blinders on, <laughs> keep my eye on the prize. Things that were going on around me, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to. But when you're trying to keep those blinders on. There are external forces that could sort of steer you in a particular direction. Was it Seaver? Was it Kuzman? Was it McGraw? Gentry? Ryan? Or was it simply Rube Walker who was the biggest early influence on you at the major leagues? I would say Tommy and, and Jerry first and then Rube right behind them. And when I first came up they put my locker right between Tom and Jerry and I couldn't have been in a better spot. So it, it worked out very, very well. And how did that manifest in making you a better pitcher? Well, Kuzi would talk from a left-handed perspective about how to face guys and sequencing pitches, location, things like that. Information he had on various hitters. Tommy talked more theory about the game in general, body preparation, sleep, eating habits, training, stuff like that. And, uh, and believing in yourself. Uh, confidence. How 
closely do you pay attention to the way the game is played today with pitchers, ideally if they're starters, working on their fifth day but not really being expected to go more than six innings? You know, Rube, I think, wanted you guys throwing as often as possible. Do you, are you aware enough of how the game is, is managed and pitched today to where you can compare it with your day and maybe it raises your eyebrows a little bit? It, it raises my eyebrows, but I, I'm from that era, so that's what I'm familiar with. Yeah. That's what I know. That's what I experienced. Um, there wasn't any radar gun. There wasn't any computer telling us what this algorithm meant. You had some history about guys, and you were expected to go as far into the ball game as you could, and you trained to do that. Uh, the game has morphed into something somewhat different. Starters expected to get you through five, and then you have all these specialty guys that get you through the rest of the game. Uh, it's certainly different. Whether it's better or worse, I can't speak to that. Did you even know how hard you were throwing? You said, I mean, you, the, the radar gun wasn't then what it is now in you, terms of everybody knowing, but did you even know? I don't think you can clock it with a sundial. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but could you? I mean, did you know? I, I, I don't know. I, I know that I threw hard enough to break some bats and, <laughs> and keep guys from hitting it solidly as often as possible. Those were the ways that I gauged whether I was doing what I needed to do. If I was giving up hard hit balls, I was in trouble. You know, there's another left-hander that was on the staff when you broke in and was there for the first two, three years of your career. Ray Sadecki, who had had success in his day with the St. Louis Cardinals and the San Francisco Giants, he was left-handed as well. Did he help you or become anything resembling a, a mentor? To a certain degree, yeah. I mean, er everybody helped one another. It was one of those things where we were a team. We were pulling together, so any information that you had or that they had that could have helped me in that instance uh, came my way, and I was able to sift through it and use what I could. And Rube was there for so long, really, coming over with, Joe, with uh, Gil Hodges for the 1968 season, and he was there about 13, 14 years. What was the biggest impact that Rube had on your development? Just general quietness, I think. He never got overly excited one way or another. I don't think I ever saw him get mad. Um, he spoke very infrequently, but when he did speak, he had something of quality to say, and it was a, a very steadying influence. And speaking of development, there's a man who, to this day, does not receive anywhere near as much credit as he Agreed. deserves for developing a lot of the kids who became champions here, not only in 1973, but part of the 1969 world champion pitching staff as well was developed by Whitey Herzog. And a lot of people don't think of Whitey as a Met. He was the third base coach for a while, but then was the director of player development, and he had to have been working pretty closely with you at times as you came through the farm system. What was your relationship with Whitey and his impact on your early career? It was a good relationship. He was actually, I, I, I don't know what his title was, but he was one of the higher-ups in the scouting department when mm -hmm. I was in high school and was ultimately signed, uh, and then was involved on the periphery as an instructor at uh, Instructional League, and I would see him traveling around from team to team uh, when I was in the minor leagues, and was always positive and confident and was pushing you in the right direction to be the best that you could be. Uh, always thought highly of Whitey, thought he was a great guy. Whitey had not managed yet in the major leagues when he was working in the Mets farm right. system and developing all of your contemporaries. Did you think at any point, knowing Whitey Herzog, that that's a guy who's going to be a pretty good big league manager someday? Yeah, I, again, at that point in time, I was <laughs> focused on one thing, getting as many outs as I could get and go back in the dugout. Well, there's, there's one time you didn't go back in the dugout on your own power, and I know you're asked about this, I'm sure, from those who remember. There's a guy named Marty Perez who played with the Atlanta Braves. Oh, I got a headache. This is, 1973, he's still pointing to the spot, but he hit a line drive that knocked you flat on your back, hitting you just where you pointed. You're pretty lucky in retrospect, Very aren't lucky. you? Very lucky. It was a difficult situation in that I firmly believe, number one, that if I had seen the ball all the way, one of two things would have happened. I either gotten out of the way or caught it, uh, but I didn't see it. I overthrew a pitch in a rainy situation after I thought I had gotten a bad call on a check swing on a 2-2 curveball that made it 3-2 with the bases loaded. I'm trying to get this guy out in the crucial part of the ball game. Lost track of the pitch on the way to the plate. I hit too hard, overthrew the ball. I hear the bat crack. I know he's hit it, but I don't see it until it literally is right there. It tipped my fingertips, hit the bill of my cap, and hit me right over the left eye. And what was the next thing you remembered? Were you out cold for any no, time? No, it, it, it didn't knock me out. I had a flash, like a flash cube went off in my face, and I thought I'd gotten hit in the mouth. My teeth hurt. Um, and I'm laying on the mound. I literally laid down because I knew I was hurt, and I'm trying to figure out what was hurt, and I reached for my mouth, and Grody grabbed my hand and said, no, wait for the trainer. And about that time, I could see the bump on my forehead by looking oh, up. It had raised. 
uh, it was a little bit of a scary situation. Incredibly, if I'm not mistaken, you pitched something like 12 days later? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't know that that would be allowed today, given the Probably various not. protocols that they have. But what was the recovery period like? I mean, did you think at the end of that night that your career was in jeopardy or that this was going to be a relatively quick recovery because it wasn't as bad as it could have been? I found out about Herb Score the next day when I saw oh, his yeah. picture next to mine in the newspaper. And that was a little eye-opening because he didn't come back. And so I, my goal at that moment was I'm gonna. And I really had no ill effects when I came out of it the next morning. Um, the swelling was down. I didn't feel bad, just a little weak. Um, went back and saw the doc after they let me out of the hospital and got checked out. They made me wear some kind of a protective band in case I got hit again. And that was the only way they let me back on the field. Had to do that for eight weeks. Uh, other than that, it was whether or not I was going to react differently when a ball was hit toward me. And, and did that you was, at all? Yeah, I didn't, and I was very fortunate. I thought I didn't have anything hit back at me the next game. It was against the Pirates. I think I pitched six innings. Um, but there were numerous balls hit to second and to short, so it was in my general direction, and, and I never flinched or lost sight of the ball or blinked or anything like that. So I figured that was it. I'm okay. I'll go keep going. Did that begin to affect anything, even in the short term? about how you approached hitters? Were you concerned about, I gotta stay away from the barrel now? Or, or you know, you always wanna do that, obviously, but, but did it affect anything about your? No, it really didn't. I, I guess I was just young and dumb enough. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna go do my thing and, and hopefully not let anything get in the way. Well, before you left the Mets in a trade that landed you with the Texas Rangers, uh, you were the co-MVP of the All-Star Game in 1975. I believe that was in Milwaukee. Yes. Was Bill Madlock. I mean, imagine that. Matt Lack and Matt Lock. <laughs> what are the sharing, odds? Yeah, sharing the All Star MVP award. But, but what do you remember about the pageantry and ultimately not only your performance, but the honor of being given co MVP? Well, it was quite an honor, and I certainly appreciate all of that. But the, the, the funny part about the whole thing is there's a long walk in that old stadium to go down and up the tunnel, the stairs mm -hmm. all the way up to the clubhouse. And you kept hearing this voice, Mad Lack. And I'm telling Bill, Billy, they're calling you to go back on the field. And he said, no, man, they're calling you. you got to go back on the field. <laughs> the commissioner finally had to send somebody up there to get both of us to come back down on the field uh, for the co-MVP situation. They only had one trophy, and they said since I was in New York, I'd get mine later, and Bill got to take his with him. Well, he pitched in the World Series in 1973. He pitched one of the great clutch games in franchise history. You traded, as we mentioned, after the 1977 season. What happened? To the Mets between say 73 and why didn't they win more or, or what what changed here other than the obvious which was players coming and going? I don't honestly know uh, it would be hard to put a finger on I know I thought we had a, a really quality nucleus of, of pitching and, and defense and possibly only needed just a little more offense somewhere along the line to be able to put it all together why that didn't come about I can't begin to tell you but when they dismantled the pitching staff it sort of took things apart and they had yeah. to start all over again. Well, somewhat famously Seaver had pleaded with the front office to sign Gary Matthews in particular during the first winter of free agency feeling and probably with a legitimate sense that the Mets really were only a, a bat or so away from being a serious contender with the pitching you guys had. Um, Tom was very vocal about it, but th did you or any of the other uh, pitchers make that sentiment known to the front office as well? I did, but not nearly as openly as Tom did. And it was just simply, a, you know, we got a pretty good core of guys here. If we could just add the, mm -hmm. that final piece of the puzzle, we're probably going to be in really good shape. Uh, and, and I think mistakenly that was taken as I wanted to be traded <laughs> because that's what ultimately happened. So when that did happen, were you, in a sense, relieved because you were going away from a team that was about to, unfortunately, be picked apart and, and get a fresh start somewhere else? Or did it hurt to leave New York? Uh, no, it hurt. And in reality, I was in total shock um, when the phone call came. They said, there's good news and bad news. The good news is we got Willie Montanez. The bad news, <laughs> bad news is, is you're being traded to Texas. Uh, and it was total disbelief at that point. I mean, it was my reality shock into the fact that this is really a business. Well, good news and certainly good fortune for the New York Mets was that John Matlack was a big part of a team that won the pennant in 1973. He was the 1972 National League Rookie of the Year, and it is great to see you back here in New York, John. Thanks, Howie. It's good to be here. John Matlack, my guest. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.